Today is August 12th, 1996. Our survivor is Martin Sun and Lori Fine from Brooklyn, New York, the United States of America, and our language is English. Today is August 12th, 1996. Our survivor is Martin Sun and Lori Fine from Brooklyn, New York, the United States of America, and our language is English. Good morning. Good morning. Could you please tell us your name, the spelling? Martin Sun. M-A-R-T-I-N-S-O-H-N. What was your name at birth? Moses Song. And your Hebrew name? Moish Song. Did you ever have any other names? No. Could you give us your date of birth? July the 3rd, 1925. And how old are you now? 71. Could you tell us where you were born? Kliniana, Poland. Could you spell this? G-L-I-N-I-A-N-Y. Poland, P-O-L-A-N-D. Could you tell us what this place looked like? What the place? It's yes, the, the town. What did it look like? Well, it was a small town. Uh, about 5,000 residents, about 2,000 Jews, about 3,000 other nationalities, Polish and Ukraine, mostly Ukraine. There were about three churches in Ukraine, one Polish church. What did it look like? Were there any mountains or rivers? Uh, no, not close by. It was a small river, but minor, not any main. Uh, The Jews mostly lived in the center of this, and surroundings were farmers and Polish and Ukraine, mostly Ukraine. Do you remember your house? Yeah, sure. It had the, in a very old house, but in 1937 we built a very big new house. It was in the wrong time. Did you ever Couldn't get to live in it? it? No. Couldn't finish it, maybe. What did your house look like? Your house before that one? It was, I would say, a very small house, uh, one flat. Uh, built with bricks and, but small. For us, it was small because we had a business in it too. So we had to, or build or move. So we built. Do you remember the exact address of the house? Yes, it was Slochowska 3. What was the Jewish community like in your town? I would say it was mostly Orthodox. The young generation were already... Uh, some of them were moving away from the Orthodox. Very few, though. Uh, there were more, a lot of them moved to this, read a lot of socialist uh, books and uh, because of the poverty mostly. They were, they were poor. There were no jobs for Jews. What did they do to support themselves? And the only thing they could have done was business. They couldn't be a policeman. They couldn't be uh, any employee of the city. So the only job for them was to be a uh, uh, small merchant or uh, or whatever, but uh, for young people that was the end because they wanted something better and they couldn't just follow that. They were professionals, they couldn't go even to universities neither, to schools, because uh, they there was a quota. And then, so, in our little town, they didn't, they didn't have even a high school. To go to high school, they had to go to a big town. To go to a big town, you need the money. Unless you had the money, if you don't have the money, you, you were stuck. Without that education, the only thing you could do was just reading. And reading by yourself. And the reading was, was probably that brought the people to socialism, to 
socialistic uh, ideas uh, because of the poverty. So, and at the same time, there were the Zionist organization, which was the only way out was to go to Israel. And uh, most of the kids belong to this. Some of them belong to socialist uh, the organizations, some of them belong to uh, the uh, religious, uh, but still all of them Zionist with an idea to, to get out. Did you belong to any of those organizations? Yes, I did belong. Which ones? I belong to Bnei Akiva. And uh, that was the dream celebration uh, the weekends to uh, to go there and have fun and enjoy with the with the other kids play ball soccer and uh, and so on and that was our, our enjoyment that was Saturday afternoon and Sunday was you had to study for school and prepare for Monday and, and so on it's like everywhere anywhere else it's the same thing I'd like you to tell us about your family. Could you start with your father and his name? Yeah, my father was Wolf, Wolf's son. And we had a business. We were middle class. We weren't rich, we weren't poor in Eve, I would say. Uh, we had a, a beer distribution. And uh, we had a uh, bottling uh, machinery for bottling the beer. So we were well off, but it, considering we were well off there. Uh, I cannot compare the, with the living here, but that's why I say, considering there, we were well off. I mean, we didn't miss anything that uh, there wasn't that time. We didn't have a car. <laughs> When you think back to your father, what comes to mind? My father was a Zionist. He was, because we had papers to come to America, and uh, he did not want to. And history was Israel to go. When did and he get those papers? The papers he got from. Uh, our uncle here in the United States at his wedding. When was this? That was 1922. And uh, they got the papers. I don't know, after the wedding they got the papers because my uncle came to the wedding there and he told him he'll send out the papers. He did send him out the papers and uh, even during the, we had the papers during the war and we just looked at them and, and cried and I said, we should have used them, but we didn't. He, he was a Zionist. He said, if I have to get out of here, that will be to our country. And and we stood there. What was your mother's name? Rachel. And her maiden name? Madela. Did your mother work? Yeah, she did help in the business. She helped in the business. And uh, for the children, we did have a help. For the children, and she worked in business. She was like a matriarch, you know. It's uh, holding the family together, and it's uh, it's amazing how her mother is is a mother for everybody. What special memory do you have of her? Strong decision making. Uh, she was more like a, a leader, and besides a good mother and, and everything else, and, and I would say she was a leader and a matriarch. Could you tell me about your brothers and sisters? Yeah, I had the bigger brother, two years older. What was his name? Uh, Yitzi. And, uh, and I had a sister. Lola, who also survived. What's her married name now? Now her married name is Sperling. 
And then I had a little sister. She was in that time seven years old. And it was uh, Bronya, or Bronca. And uh, that was it, four kids. Do you remember the grandparents? I do remember, but little, because they died before the war. Uh, my father's uh, my mother died in 1936 or something like that. And my mother's mother died in about 1935. Do you remember their uh, names? Yeah. One was, the father's mother was Nita, and my mother's uh, my mother was uh, Shlomit, or Shloma, Shloma. They used to call her Shloma. You had mentioned household help with the younger children. Do you remember who helped you in the house? We had uh, a help. Uh, Do, you aid, remember, maid, yeah. Do you remember the name? Oh, we had a few. <laughs> the last one was Yevka. Yevka, the Korean. Yeah, she was still till the war, till uh, 1939, till the Russians, 1939 the war broke out, the Russians came in, so you didn't, couldn't have any help no more. So we got, the, we had to help ourselves. Did you stay in contact with her though? No, she wasn't from our uh, place of Indiana, uh, she was from far away, so she went home and Never heard from her. Do you remember what languages were spoken in your home? The home to the kids was Swedish. Most. And then, actually, Polish I started to speak when the first we went to school. It was tough. Because we went to Polish school and even though we knew some Polish, but it wasn't the right uh, the right way for children. It was hard for children that were speaking only Yiddish to go into a school and uh, and uh, speak Polish, the right to speak and everything and understand. But uh, we managed and we got a language and started another language because in school in sixth grade uh, yeah, you needed yet uh, Ukrainian because yeah we had to take Ukrainian. And in the seventh I remember we had to take German. That was the last uh, last year before the war. Yeah. What was school like for you? Do you remember any of the subjects you took? Well, elementary, everything. It's, uh, Polish was the main uh, subject, and was arithmetic and uh, writing. They were specifically in geography. They were on these two subjects. They were very uh, strong for that uh, to follow history. Do you remember the name of the school you went to? I don't think I had. It was a Polish school because it was one Polish school and one Ukrainian school. So all the Ukrainians went to Ukrainian school. And the Polish, the Jewish and the Polish uh, went to the Polish school. So that was the only school in town, Polish. Did you go to any other schools? Uh, no. Did you have any Jewish education? Yes, private. How was that yes. arranged? My father uh, arranged it. We had a private tutor come to the house and teach us Hebrew and, uh, and Yiddish and, and so on. What was a typical day like for you? Uh, <coughs> well, in the day, in the beginning, it was 8 o'clock. We had to be in school uh, till 2 o'clock. Most of the days till 2 o'clock. Come home with lunch and uh, playing ball with the kids and doing homework like Doing some homework and that's it. Not much like any other kids here, I guess. No television, no. <laughs> we didn't have that luxury. No. Do you remember the names of any of your friends? Friends, yes. It's uh, Michael and uh, Shimon and there are a lot of friends. It's hard to. <laughs> Getting right now, the, most of them were neighbors. Michael was my best friend; it was like next door neighbor. Which I remember most. As a young child, what were your plans for the future? Your dreams? 
I, I think as a child I remember I would uh, accept uh, to emigrate to Israel if there wasn't a possibility I would be with my parents in the business, something like that. I don't know. That was my my dream. I didn't have any dreams of any schooling because I think we had the opportunity to go to from a small town to a big town and and study. And whoever was born in a big town maybe had a better uh, opportunity. From a small town was hard unless some special cases that got out of the town and somehow had opportunity in the big town to to go and study. There were some. <coughs> How did you identify as a Jew? Oh, that was very easy. I had to wear a hat. Uh, I didn't wear tzitzit. So, uh, well, it wasn't that I had to wear that. I was a Jewish boy because none uh, of the others wore hats. So uh, that was... And then, did uh, you attend the show? Yes. Do you remember the name? Every of it? Saturday. No, it was Bissamadrish. Bissamadrish. Did it have a rabbi? Uh, no, not a steady one. No. It did not have. But there were some well... Uh, people well... There was one that had a smicha and he was more or less the, the leader, but he wasn't the rabbi of the Shul sure, now. That like a president and do the other work, but not a rabbi now. What was Shabbos like for you? Shabbos was that you should rest and don't do anything else but to go to Shul and then after for kids special, go after lunch and uh, play soccer or play with the boys or, uh, and so on. For the parents, my father was special. His paper reading and and uh, do some tilling or, or some other uh, studying. He did study though on Saturday. What were the meals yeah. like? Do you remember the meals? Meals were like well, fish and and uh, you had to have fish and, and uh, chicken and <laughs> and meat, whatever. That's what we had every. Saturday night and Sunday morning. Yeah, Sunday lunch. Do you remember singing any Zmiros at the time? Yes, table? we did sing Shalom Aleich. Could you sing it? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> what was Pesach like? Pesach was very strict. It was very strict. It was probably... Uh, the, the cleaning started up few weeks before and then cleaning and cleaning and cleaning and Did cleaning. Did you help? Oh, uh, no, <laughs> I did not. Neither of these kids, we did not uh, participate, but uh, we did have help and uh, a lot of cleaning. I know it was very strict with everything. Do you remember suckers? Yes, we did have a sucker in the house. A part of the, uh, the roof picked up, and we were sitting in the house. It was very uh, nicely done. What happened when it rained? It did not rain. In. It was done nicely. But it did not rain. in. Just for circus, it picked up the, the roof, and we were sitting in the house, and, the, and it was very nice. Beautiful. Yeah. Do you remember Purim? Uh, Purim, yes. It wasn't as big as here. Uh, the kids did uh, go around and get some uh, gold money or something like that, but uh, it wasn't as big as here. Now here they're making it a little bigger uh, holiday than we used to. Uh, so uh, in your home, but, you mentioned you didn't have a television, but did you have a radio or newspapers? Yeah. Newspapers, my father used to get the Jewish paper, but uh, he used to get it like a day after because it came from uh, Lemberg. 
So he used to read the, uh, the old Jewish paper. As children, we didn't read the paper. I don't know, if we weren't interested in, uh, in world affairs or the president of uh, Poland, uh, we did not. Uh, we were more interested in playing ball and, and other things. I don't know, maybe here they're a little more advanced or uh, I don't know, but we knew our, our geography maybe better. <laughs> did you have any non-Jewish friends from school? Yeah, all my, uh, a lot of them, because we lived almost in the part of Ukraine at the end of the Jewish town. So, uh, the neighbors, so they were Ukrainians. Not that I went with them to school, because they went to Ukrainian school. And I went to the Polish school. Uh, I had one Polish friend, uh, Polinski, and, uh, he was sitting near me right in school all the time, and it was like pals, uh, and, uh, yeah, it's, we we're friends, we didn't, uh, fight because of, uh, religion, no, I mean, very rarely, you know, it was a fight because of the Jewish, uh, no, we did not. First of all, the Polish kids were a minority in, this, in my class. So they, they didn't dare because we were the majority. I know in my class we had only about five kids Polish and about 20 Jewish kids. So, uh, Did you ever feel any anti-Semitism when you were growing up? Uh, no. I didn't as a kid. I, I don't think so. Were there any pogroms in your area? No. No, no pogroms. When did Until you first become aware of the rise of the Nazis in Germany? I heard only from my father reading in the paper that uh, bad times are, is coming for us. How it did you feel about that when you heard it? I it didn't. It, that's not me. I'm only a little boy. It is only for the Jews uh, with the beard, for the frame, for the. I thought that it isn't that for us. I mean. We are just like the other kids, so we are not the real Jew with a big nose or with a strammel or them. These are the ones that are supposed to get, be afraid of. That was my, uh, my opinion as a kid. I, I, I was wrong because later on everybody was the same. But as a kid, I, I wasn't afraid. Even before the war, I know, I, uh, the war started already. I said, oh, I'm going to see the soldiers in the army pressing by. And, and a matter of fact, I was standing right out. Uh, what, do you the, what do you remember about that? I was standing right out with the, with the Ukrainian boys. And, uh, and the German army came in and, and marched. And the Ukrainians gave them uh, uh, flowers and drinks. And uh, we were standing there. I wasn't afraid. Do you remember? Was this September 1st, 1939 or after? Yes, we did. I remember because we did run away in that time we ran away. We ran away toward the Russian border. And we were close to the border when the Russians uh, uh, intervened and, and they came in with their army. They took over part of the Ukrainians, so we didn't get the Germans in 1939. So what happened in your area? In my area, it was the Russians came in and... When was this? 1939. What date do you remember? Oh, uh, well, what was this, September? I don't remember. I think it was September. Yes, it was September. Uh, the Russian army came in and... Uh, Everybody started to get jobs, and instead of having business, had to be employed already by the government because there was no more uh, uh, small businesses or uh, so. Uh, most what happened of it, to your father's business? Uh, he was working for the for the government, but that stayed. He time. stayed. He stood the same thing, but uh, as an employee instead of uh, uh, because he was still small business. Some bigger businesses they. Uh, 
they nationalized, they took them away to Siberia few and uh, and so on. But uh, we didn't feel too much a difference because they were still allowed to go to shul and still did the same thing but before and so it was except the, the poor people felt a little better because they had jobs, they were a little bit relieved, they were the same as the others. No more, uh, he's a poor, he's a rich, he's a... So uh, I think they felt a little better at that time. How do you think your father felt at that time? Uh, I don't know. In, in a way, he felt maybe the poor people had the right for... Uh, for a job and, and a living to make a living, a decent living. And, uh, uh, you know, he was a passionate man, even though he was religious. And at the same time, it, they didn't bother the religion so, so, so badly. So it wasn't much different, except that he didn't have his business. He had to work for somebody, for the government. How did Canada. your day change? How, how did your life change when they came to power? Uh, not much. Not much. The only thing, I lost one year in schooling because the first year in September they came in, they didn't open the school. Uh, what did you do then? They, nothing. They just played around hooky a whole year. And the next year they opened up the school and they had to go again for the same seventh grade because they lowered, the, they said that the, their standard of uh, school is higher. So I had to take over the same uh, seventh grade. That was the end, the two years till 41. Then were the Germans uh, attacked. Were there any new laws that the Germans, uh, that the Russians had put into place? Uh, laws where you're not allowed to have your own business. Anything this else? Is, no. Uh, I don't think so, no. Well, you couldn't be a landlord. Because if you had a big uh, building, they they were was taken away. And what about food supplies? You had to buy in, in the stores. They made the uh, cooperatives. Was there enough to buy? Yeah. Ah, uh, I don't know enough. Maybe not, but uh, there was enough food. I would say. Yeah. What was the relationship between the Jews and the non-Jews when the Russians were in control? I would say the Jews had a little the upper hand uh, because of the jobs, opportunities. Not because they were Jews, not because the Russians liked better the Jews or not, because the, most of the town was were farmers, so they didn't need the jobs. The Jews needed the jobs because they were poor, and they relied on, on getting jobs to be a bookkeeper, to be a to get the this is the time they could get a job before they couldn't get this job. Where the, the Ukrainians didn't need exactly these jobs. They were still farming their farms and they were still going on with their businesses. Were there any accusations from the non-Jews that the Jews had cooperated with the Russians? Well, later on, there was one Jew, let's say he was in the police station. He was, maybe he did cooperate. So if one or two cooperate, it doesn't mean anything. So uh, they, they, he was killed anyway. When the Germans came in, he was the first one to uh, to apprehend, and uh, and the police station was right near us, a half a block away, and I could hear the screams where they were uh, uh, beating them. That you could hear probably till the next, uh, the end of the of the town. Can I stop it, <coughs> This is tape two. Today is August 12th, 1996, and our survivor is Martin Sun. My name is Martin Sun, you want me? And, uh... What happened next? Uh, this is about June the 6th, I think, when the war started. On the first Sunday, it was an uh, uh, airplane uh, knocked uh, down 
a Soviet airplane by the Germans and fell right uh, uh, outside of our town. I remember that we all the kids, not only Jews, and wanted to go and see the, the plane because to us it was something new. I mean, a war. We didn't see kids like war soldiers and so on. And we went out and we see the, the, the airplane and we went home. And within a few days, the Germans were in town already. We didn't have a chance to run away. I mean, uh, in 39 we did run away. But in 41, we didn't have a chance. They were too fast. Within a few days, two days, three days, they were, they were in town already. They, was, they were encircled everywhere. Did you realize what had happened in the rest of Poland to the Jewish population? Yes, we did. But at the same time, it wasn't so bad. We didn't hear any uh, killings. We did not hear these things. We heard taken into the concentration camp and... and uh, and taking a... What did you think this meant? I don't know. It, it meant that it's the war, that it will go all about it. It's the same thing like other wars that Jews uh, uh, suffer to pogroms and things like that. that. This will be over too. And, uh, and we didn't think that with the Russian army there, that they will be able to just come and just like that. It's, uh, nobody thought of it. It's, uh, I thought the Russians were so strong and my God, so big, so strong, and it wasn't uh, right. How did the Germans appear when they came in? Uh, the Germans were soldiers, very neat. I mean, uh, even though I was surprised to see them with horses, I thought they were all with uh, mechanized, and it wasn't true. There were horses were given uh, uh, on horses, and the horses were carrying their uh, ammunition and all that, or everything on horses. It, it was unbelievable. And but at the same time, I don't know. Maybe through our town, they didn't have good roads, so the mechanized uh, uh, army didn't go through. But uh, but that was my impression that uh, I was uh, disappointed that it wasn't uh, because I thought that Germans would come and they were so mechanized and up to date and they weren't. How would you compare the coming in of the Russians to the coming in of the Germans? Uh, well, the Russians came in, it, it was like liberators actually to some people, and not liberators, to some people they were liberators because. Uh, they gave them jobs to the poor people. I mean, to the other people, it was just another, another. to us it wasn't much a difference, Poland or, or Polish or Russian, because it wasn't Israel, it wasn't our country. So if we work, if we were good citizens, and then we lived good, then, uh, I mean, we got paid and uh, could raise a family. That's all what the uh, people wanted, actually. It's... Uh, and that was the right. That was the difference from the Russians to the Germans. I mean, maybe uh, to the Ukrainians it was not uh, the same, but to me, the Germans were bad. I mean, uh, the beginning, it wasn't so bad. It got progressively uh, worse as, uh, as it went on. In our time, we were lucky. Because in each town, when the Germans came in, they had these uh, these uh, storm groups. I don't know what they call these. Uh, the the Toten uh, Brigade, and they were just taking out five hundred people, four hundred people, and and just uh, to the forest and whatever, and they in the pits, and they killed them. In our town, we were just lucky. They took out uh, about ten. It's supposed to be intelligentsia. But well, they were just uh, plain teachers and uh, it wasn't any politicians or so just plain ten people. I don't know why they picked ten. And they took him out in the forest and they shot him. How did you know the, what happened? Because later they brought him in. They, they uh, intervened, they, they bribed the, the, the mayor of the city and, and, and they went to show them where they were buried. 
and they reburied them in the Jewish cemetery. Who did this? Who made these arrangements? The Judenrat. When did you have a Judenrat established? A Judenrat, they established right away a Judenrat when the Germans came in. I don't know who appointed them. I really don't know. All I knew was there is a Judenrat. Do you remember who served on it? Yeah. It was Hochberg, and he was the eldest, and that was uh, dentist, uh, and that was on dentist Nas. And there were about four or five. What was their function mm -hmm. in town? In a way, it was to uh, keep or, uh, to keep the people uh, notified. Whatever new laws come in. What new laws do you remember? Well, the first laws like a Jew cannot go into the stores to their stores. A Jew cannot has to uh, wear the the white uh, armband with a uh, did, Martin David. Did it have any writing on it? Yeah, Martin David. Uh, any any blah, words? Blah, 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 blah. No. no. And uh, to share the beards of the old Jews. Every time, every day was new laws came in. So it would be probably uh, silly to mention uh, such a laws, but uh, they were laws. I mean, they came in. Uh, all Jews that have a beard has to come into the police station and there was one be sitting there and Cut the beard and pay two dollars. I mean, you had to pay for them and come. So it's silly laws, but there were laws coming in. What happened to the businesses that the Russians had taken and they nationalized, were, and then Jews were employed? Did they keep those jobs when no. the Germans came in? No, no, there were no more jobs. Whatever it was left, these stores were looted right away and uh, once the the Russians were out the army was out was looted by the by the people by the Ukrainians so there were no, no more stores there were only one or two stores where the cooperatives were uh, sold or, or whatever they needed to, uh, how did you get food food everybody had to get of their own I mean this was if you had a store of uh, uh, shirts or blouses or whatever so you hid and or you hid them in your house or you hid them by by uh, one of your acquaintances a ukrainian or, or and you used to go there and in exchange for food i mean that's the only way you got food it's uh what was the food consists of just of uh, bread and uh, and potatoes this was the main uh, did you have schools? We had we had enough potatoes that lasted us for for the whole winter. And we had enough potatoes, but at the same time we had to share with other people because people came around and beg and uh, and, and it was couldn't say no. I mean, uh, we didn't say no. Let's put it that way. It's did and you this have is, any schooling then? Any schools were any schools no. open? No, no school, no, no, no more schools for Jewish kids, no, no. How did you spend your day? A day was, we spent the days hiding, because in the beginning we thought that this was only for all the Jews. Uh, not for us, little boys, uh, come on, we're not going to do anything to us. But it turned out just different, uh, the opposite, because they started to catch the young ones for work. So the, the first thing they caught me and my brother. What was his name? Yitzhak. Yitz. And uh, they, told, they told us take a pail and uh, one a broom. Took a pail and a broom. I said, oh, right. we came near the police station already. I see there are a lot of people already, a lot of Jews there. Some were uh, pouring water on on the street, and the others were uh, uh, pouring the street. And it's it was nothing to to clean. Uh, it was just humiliating. And then there were the horses standing there, and they told uh, all Jews uh, to go under the horses, clean the hooves, clean under the bellies. And the horses were kicking. And it, it was a terrible scene. It was 
so we seen it was bad. We didn't know at that time. But in the other part of the town, it was already accumulated another group of another about 50 people. And the way we heard later that they were supposed to kill us, go out and uh, out of town and kill us. Something happened. They didn't show up. The, the, the Germans didn't show up. And after a day's work with, with this pail of water and then cleaning the street, they released us. So we were just lucky uh, because there was one of those things. Uh, then anyway, we didn't, weren't prepared because uh, my father was hiding already. Because no, he was hiding. Uh, we, we had friends, the, the, uh, the mayor of the city was a very close friend of it. And he gave us uh, permission to hide. He had uh, in, in the firehouse. And the firehouse actually was in our property. So we went in and to hide there. Nobody could go come into the firehouse. So we were safe. And that time my father was hiding. Because we thought that it's not for little boys. It is just for Jews. And we are, we are not Jews. We are just little boys. And that was the difference that they made us right away uh, think differently than you. We mean you. We mean everybody. And, and it's not only the beard it was just an excuse to come and, and share the beard for, for two dollars. Uh, that wasn't the point. It was, this was just a show for them. Did you ever have to wear a yellow star? Yes. So when was that? That was in the, in the camp. But uh, we are far away from the camp yet. Uh, I'll tell this story later a little bit because a lot of telling to be done before that. Uh, the thing is they started to, to, to organize the, the camps along the highway between Lemberg and Slotov. And they made camps uh, every uh, 10 miles or every few Wherever they, they could find a monastery where they could concentrate the Jews there. And uh, they made, so far as I know, it's three. It was uh, Yachtorov. It was one in, uh, not the first one. Latsk. And the first the main one that they caught, 50 of them. What? I forgot the first one. I'll come back to it later. <laughs> uh, to the first one, they caught 50. They came to the town and they asked for 50 people. Who provided them? The Judenrat provided. Actually, it, was, it wasn't like a catching. They just came into the house and they said, Well, you are of age, like you're 18 or 19. Uh, you're not going to the army, you're going to work, and we will uh, watch over you. We will be in contact with the, with the, uh, commandant and, uh, and they got 50 people, 50, uh, mostly young people between the ages 18 and 21 or something like that. Whoever got away hit, hit, but very few, most of them, they got out there. Within, uh, two months later, they came and they wanted another 30 to the next, uh, Yachtorov. And then we knew we had to hide. So my older brother, he was already of age. So when they came knocking in the door, he, we had already a, a hiding place in the house. So he jumped in and then to the hiding place. And I ran into his bed because they came and they seen it's a warm bed. Where is he? So I ran into his bed and they came in anyway, they took me instead. How old were you? I was 15. How old was your brother? He was 17. He was two years older. Uh, Where did you think you were so going? I didn't know. I, I knew they'd catch into another camp, but I didn't know. Everybody was afraid of the next camp. Uh, so they brought me to the police station to the Judenrat station. That was the Judenrat, the, po the Jewish police cordon. And they locked me in in the basement of the Judenrat. And one policeman was watching. 
when I came, when I got me there, there were the other five already there. I was, I think, the sixth. Also young, my age, even younger. But poor kids. And maybe if somebody had some money, maybe could have paid out and got out from it. But I don't know how they got to know. My little sister came to the door, to the window there to see me and I told her bring me all the keys I thought maybe I'll be able to open the door from the inside and get out so she brought me all the keys took it that she could find and and when she came and I tried all the keys and it didn't work it didn't match so she came again and I told her listen bring me a hammer and a chisel so she came she brought me the hammer and a chisel and when I seen the policeman, he was walking, he was away, I tried it to, to uh, chisel out a panel of the door, the middle panel. Did anybody else realize what you were doing? Any of the people incarcerated with you? No, they liked it. They, they thought if I uh, can do it, they will get out too, because we were all uh, together on it. Did so, anybody help you? No, I did it myself. And uh, I almost... Got it, but they, they, uh, somebody heard the knocking and came in and gave me a, uh, beating, took away my, uh, the hammer and the chisel, and he went up to show it to the police, to the eldest or whatever that's happening. At the same time, I loosened that panel and I got out. I got out and all five after me. We all got out. The only thing that happened is I knew where to run, to hide. I didn't run to home. The other poor kids didn't have where to run, so they ran home, and they were apprehended right after. Where did you go? I went to my uh, to, uh, to the fireplace, to the fireman, and that they couldn't get in. weren't allowed to go. So, uh, and then they, they sent away right to, to the camp, and I was out. So this was my first escape. My uh, my try was good. It was it was a successful uh, escape. I was proud of it, and everybody was proud of it, and uh, I was safe. Time being, I don't know for how long, but uh, it worked. And the next thing, everybody had to work. Was uh, a ghetto created? No, it was no ghetto. It was no. We didn't have a ghetto in our town. Uh, Everybody had to work, so the unit assigned work. There was uh, one big landowner, and he needed a lot of uh, people to work in the fields. And uh, so they were assigned to him. Now, we were assigned already to the uh, mayor's, uh, under the mayor's protection. I worked for the mayor's father-in-law, and he had a farm. So I helped him with the farm. So you went out from the fire station? Yeah, yeah. I worked there. So I was protected, actually, because uh, they knew that I was uh, working for him. So the UNAP knew that. And, and my brother was working in the mayor's uh, office there in the cleaning. Not not any uh, nicer job, but cleaning the, the, the city hall. And another two Jews, one of my cousins, too, with him. And uh, then, once I was going to the farm, I mean to the fields, I mean, driving the horses with him, you know, and at the same time they were catching Gentiles, Gentile kids, for work in Germany. Well, they seen me without the armband. I didn't wear an armband. I was a wise guy at the same time. I took my chances so many. Uh, so he got me. He said, "Uh, uh come, come down from the so I went down. And so, but uh, the other kids knew that I'm Jewish. So that he's not uh, uh, one of us. He's Jewish. Since the Germans, uh, when he heard that, he gave it to me right away. He had a stick. Remember, the first thing he gave him right over the face with a stick. And he took me to the to the police station. That was already, couldn't get out there, but I couldn't, 
uh, get out of the hammer and chisel. That was already the police station. That wasn't the the Jewish uh, basement. And so there, my mother right away ran to the mayor. Actually, to his wife, because a Jew couldn't go into the to the city hall. Went to his wife, home, and through her, she went to to her husband, and uh, they called the police station, and they said, "Young Martin's son should be released right away." And there were other people caught also to the so. Just walked out like a like a free man, but also again for how long the struggle went on, and at the same time the uh, uh, the commandant from the camp from Yachtorov Admiral came to see the mayor. For what reason I really don't know. And he seen these three boys, young boys, working there. He said, "Oh boy." Yeah, I got my three guys. What are they doing here? They should be in the camp. He took him right with him. And that was the end of freedom for my brother. He was in, and once they're in, you cannot get out. Because they, they made responsible. If one runs away, first of all, your next neighbor is responsible for you. You'll be shot. So one is, has to Watch for the other one, he shouldn't run away. Uh, if you're conscious, you wouldn't run away by yourself because you wouldn't want somebody should be killed for you because you ran away. So it worked, uh, it worked good for them. So people didn't run away. Uh, they were held by the UNRAT. Every week, the UNRAT made sure that each one of our boys from our town got a loaf of bread. If they were poor, they got from the UNRAT. If they were not poor, the families took by themselves out. And so sometimes my sister, little sister, she went with a group of other uh, kids and they were going there and each one handed over that loaf of bread and whatever else uh, they could afford. And that was going on for a long time till actually they moved us out of town, and that was the end. Once it came this new law, we knew, we knew this was the end of us. This was the crippling of the town, of crippling of the family, because when they took out one person, one kid of the family, it wasn't so bad. It was bad for the family and the kid, but she knew he's working there, and he's working hard. He gets a little loaf of bread, and uh, extra loaf of bread, and it's, the family was still intact, and like, the mother was home, especially the mother was home, because she was the supplier of food. The fathers, the men, were afraid to go out. So if the mother was still at home, that was intact, uh, that was the family still living. I wouldn't say living, but existing together, and, and it was all right. So. Where did you the, wind up going? Where did you wind up going? Wind up going was on the end of uh, 1942, December. A new law came in that we have to move to our ghetto. Where was this ghetto? The ghetto was was one Shemishlane, one, there were three ghettos that we could, they didn't care where you go, and as long as you get into our ghetto, as long as you, most of our town went to Shemishlane. We went to Busk. We had uh, uh, mommy's friend lived there, and we thought, "Well, it's good to have a friend there where to get in." You know, it's uh, how far was this from where you were? That was about twenty kilometers. I would say how did you get there? About fifty with the uh, horses and wagon. The Ukrainians. We paid them, and they took us. There. What did you take with you? Matter of fact, we took everything. We took. The, the beds, the covering for the beds, and you know whatever you have. Sh we didn't take any furniture except bed, uh, uh, coverings, and uh, linens, and uh, sheets, and uh, all the shirts. I mean underwear, uh, all these dresses, uh, clothes. 
Did you not any Jewish of... articles, any religious articles like Mitzvillin? Ah, oh, I don't think so. My father did. I, I did. My father did because I know we were after my mother died. We used to go Saint Kaddish and get and sure. So uh, when the law came, the order came to move. I know we still had one case of cognac from our old uh, business left, and we were taking that. We said, let's take this, because we never know when we might need it to bribe somebody or to exchange it or for, for a good bottle of cognac. You never know what you can do. And it did come in very, very handy. And at the same time, we had a lot of problems. So we packed everything what we were supposed to take, and we sent out even a few uh, uh, times the, the Ukrainian went with wood for uh, heating for the winter, because in December, we know we're coming in there, we're going to freeze to that if we don't take any, any wood, and you cannot go out and buy, and we had a lot of wood. So we said a lot of wood. We said we, we packed the whole uh, carriage with uh, with potatoes and uh, and uh, flour and whatever we could. We we could, we and we took it. And when we came in there, the friend not a day. The friend was a friend. The only thing her relatives came, so they went in with her. What were the conditions like there, the general conditions of this ghetto? General conditions, I would say, was better than other ghettos because it was like an open ghetto. You can go in and go out. It was no fence? Yes. No, no fence. The only thing, you had to live there. You cannot go out. There was a policeman watching. Who was he? Was he uh, Jewish or non-Jewish? He was Jewish. Policeman. Uh, So the open ghetto, why they call it open ghetto? Because once a week... On Thursday, two hours, they allow you to go out and, and buy food from the farmers. They used to come in to the town and, and, or exchange or buy whatever you were, about two hours you were allowed. Was there enough food? No, <laughs> was not allowed. Uh, if you went out and you exchanged, let's say, a piece of gold or, uh, if you had or a shirt or so on, they gave you a few pounds of potatoes. And it didn't give you a sack of potatoes. It didn't give you a few pounds of potatoes. Uh, so the, the thing, when we came to the ghetto, first they put us in a house. And there was, the people in the house were all already after a, a typhus sickness. They were, they were sick and typhus. It didn't take us two or three days. We all fell down with a sickness, typhus. I'm going to stop the typing. This is tape three. Today is August 12, 1996, and our survivor is Martin Sun. When we moved into that house, they were all sick, and it took us no more than two or three days, and we all fell sick at the same time, all five of us. Who took care of you? They, nobody. They took us to the, to a hospital. Where was this? It was in the ghetto. It was the hospital. It was a house where they kept all the sick people. They took them in there, and, but nobody could take care of them. They didn't have no homes. And it was like cuts one near the other. It could be in one room, could have been 50 or whatever. One cut near the other, you couldn't even go through. The only thing what they uh, gave us was water. And actually, I, I, I was probably out because of the high, uh, high uh, temperature that we, we got from the typhus that uh, maybe on the, when I woke up, I really don't know when I came out of, of the, 
it was the coma, but uh, it was a high temperature that I didn't know what was going on. And, and then I was all by myself. I didn't see my father was there too, but I couldn't see him because he was in the other part of the of the house. The girls, the ma mother and the and the sisters were separately in a, in a different uh, room with the ladies. But when they let, let us out, I see. I see my father, I see my sisters, but I didn't see the mother. And they told us their mother couldn't make it. She died and I'm typhus. But they gave us already another room. It was already a little better room. And uh, we when, moved when in. When people died in the ghetto, who made the arrangements for the building? The arrangement, we had uh, my uncle also moved to Busk from our town. So he made arrangements and he made sure the mother was uh, buried and uh, and he got us the room there. And we moved in there and it was not too bad. There were only two people living there in the room. There was one bookkeeper, he was working outside the gap. And one old man, a pharmacist. And he was sick also, got a typhus. I don't know from whom he got it, but we couldn't catch it no more because we had it already, so we were immune to it. And the only thing what we could help him is with water. That's the only thing. Uh, and he was always screaming, water, 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 and we gave him water, water. And he survived, it was all right. Uh, next was... Uh, we were going to work. They put us to work. One day, I was going with uh, one of my town's uh, people, a kid, a friend. He was a, a year young from me. They sent us to work to clean in a house, in a building. On the way home, we were thirsty and we wanted a drink of water. And there was the river, book, B-O-G. Is running through the town and we went down and get a drink of water, not realizing, silly kids, that all the sewers were going into that river. From there, we came home and we both got typhoid. Typhoid is not two weeks like typhus, typhoid lasts three weeks. So I went through one typhus and now I got a typhoid. And I think typhoid, you don't catch one from the other. It's only when you eat something or drink something. So I was, that was before Pesach, I remember. And uh, we got through that. Uh, the typhoid one. And then at the end of Pesach, they gave me a piece of bread or... So matzah, I, matzah, we didn't have matzah or after Pesa. And what happened, I had a relapse for another three weeks. And that was really torture, was a torture because there's no food, you cannot eat food. The only thing where you can live on was water and uh, maybe a little soup or... Uh, and I lived through the six weeks. I don't know how I made it, but I made it. Who took care of you? My father, my sister. We lived all together. And I made it through and didn't take too long after I got out of that, that the ghetto was being liquidated. How did you know Not that? Not that we knew. We knew only that other ghettos were liquidated. How did you it's get a, those reports? I don't know. Rumors. Roma said probably the Judenrat knew it because they were in contact. I don't know how. I really don't know how. It's not that it was in the paper, not that it was in, in the radio. It was from mouth to mouth. I don't know how it got to us, but you know, everybody was shaky and everybody was jittery. Uh, that is coming. Something is coming bad. I don't know why they didn't run away. I don't know because I was a kid. The only thing. I think I do remember the fear of everybody's uh, faces that the end is near, the, uh, it's coming to an end. 
uh, I don't know, living now and, and see all these movies, pictures, you say, oh, why didn't we do that? Why didn't we do that? So it's a lot of guilt in us now. Why didn't I do that? Why didn't I kill him? Why didn't I do that? But if you are not prepared to do it, you're not, you, you have to be trained to do it. Uh, otherwise, you just run like an animal. Animal could also kick back. Uh, if it's not trained, if it's not, uh, they just run. The same thing what we did. We just ran from the, from the dead. That's all we ran and we didn't know what to expect. The fear was why we didn't run away is because we didn't know if we run away what is better. If a Ukrainian will catch us and kill us or torture us or whatever he wants to do with us or to go just plainly to a camp. We did not, they did not know. We knew something is bad because we heard yet before of the gases. But I when did you first hear that? We heard rumors yet at home before we get into get to the ghetto. That was the end of nineteen. But it was just rumors. Did you believe that? Them? It. Not quite. No. The only thing we we did know the people don't come back because there was the axis. We didn't have an axis, but we did hear about the axis. They came and uh, because next time I had an axis, uh, Shemesh they took away everybody, uh, whomever they catch. An axi was 24 hours or 48 hours. They were very precision there, the Germans. 24 hour axi was 24 hours. Whoever was after the 24 hours could walk. He was free. They didn't mean him. So, uh, we didn't have axes, so where do the people go? That was the question. Couldn't kill everybody, so many people. Especially as a kid, I don't know. The only thing what I knew was fear. Fear and fear. Uh, what happened next? The next thing is, uh, it came our day. Within days, our time came. Early in the morning, usually uh, what I used to do, 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock in the morning. You hear shooting all around the town. Shoot him, shoot him. Oh, oh, that's it. We gotta go into, to the hiding place. We did have a hiding place. Not because of us, because of the people that own the house. They lived there and they prepared themselves for hiding place. All from the building went down was about, I know, 30 people, 25, 30 people. And the back part was somebody had to cough. Or something like that. And it was terrible. There was one sick person. He have kept his mouth and uh, he shouldn't cough when we hear somebody in the house. The day started in the daytime. You hear, you heard the people walking upstairs, you hear know, and, and uh, looking and, and turning over. You heard the, 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 all these things doing there upstairs. Couldn't move. Have to wait. Wait one day, we thought maybe it'll quiet down. We still hear shooting. Second day, third day at night, we said, well, that's it. We cannot stay no longer. First of all, we didn't have food. So we had, I remember, they gave out only one uh, piece of sugar. I know he prepared the owner, probably, I don't know, the rich people. They prepared sugar. So each one got a, uh, a square of sugar. Who were you with in this place? In this hiding place? There were everybody that lived in that building. Did you know the people? No. Just what I knew them that we lived together. I did not know them from before. They were from all over there. And what about the rest of your family? Oh, they were to out of uh, ghettos. They were to out of ghettos. So, uh, the third night, said so we have to send out somebody to see what's going on. So my sister, a little sister, volunteered. She went up and there were sitting two old people were sitting there, got scared first and said, well, they cleaned up our house. They left us. So we came here. They knew the people there. So they were sitting there. There was a shochet and with his wife. 
all the people and uh, and there were in our building also there were all the one couple, all the couple. So they went out with them and they were sitting and this all the couple had uh two sons, two bachelors. So one was about twenty five, twenty six, and the other was twenty eight maybe. So we said, Well, now we have to run away. We she my sister went up, she picked out whatever she could, whatever was left. She picked up, packed it up, and uh, and we took our. Uh, we started to go out. Going out, it was pouring, so hot. When was this? Okay. Remember the time of the year this was? It was time of the year. It used to be probably May, the end of April or May. It was pouring so hot. And we had to go through, we went through a church, and the church was already uh, bordering put out of the ghetto. And through the church, we went out of the ghetto, and there were the fields. And and I told the, my sisters to hold hands so should, they shouldn't get lost. Because I heard other kids screaming, Mommy, Mommy. So, by the time we went out, uh, about a kilometer from the ghetto, so we see it was close already to a little forest, uh, but it was a little forest. The two bachelors, they went in their direction. That was their direction. But we want to go to our town. It was a different direction. So, we were going through the fields, they were going toward the... But it started to dawn in the morning already, and I see from the distance, I, I could see uh, the police are on the horses. What police and, were these? What police? The Ukrainian police. In shooting to them, but we were going the other direction. We were going through another village. Uh, we went, my father was going first, and we followed, and it was made up. If he's caught, we should run. We should watch. We came into the village, and the first thing I, I, I see an open house, I said, maybe I'll go in and ask for a piece of bread. I knocked to the door, and there was a young guy eating bread and butter. And the honey on top. And I asked for a piece of bread, and he said no. Okay, I thank him, and we went out. On the way further, we came to a fork in two ways. I didn't know where my father went. <laughs> so we went the wrong way. <laughs> and then we were walking and a lady came out with two big slices of bread. She said, here kids, run. So we ran. We didn't have no choice no more to go back to the, go the other way. We had to go the way we were going. And we go, and then out of the village, in the middle of the fields, we went into the, in the middle of the fields to hide. The grass was high already, the weed was high. And we sat down and wait till it gets dark because we couldn't walk in the daytime. In the afternoon, the children were gone from school. Because over there, they had to go 
farmers' kids had to walk from one village sometimes to the next village to go to a school. They were going to school and they were playing hide and seek. So whom did they catch? They caught us. Wow, we found Jews there. Not that the kids actually meant something uh, to do us harm or not. They just, it was something that they see something, uh, something that they weren't supposed to see. And then there was that heroism among them. Who is the bigger hero to go and see them? Who wants to see the Jews? Someone said, I'll go. You know, the first one and then the second one. By the time they went there, he couldn't find us no more because we moved. We went there waiting for them to, uh, to catch us, to see us. Well, that time, they were running around and uh, looking for, uh, trying to, to catch us, but no harm done. And they were going, they walked away home. They weren't going home and, and we were sitting waiting till the night falls and what were you wearing uh, do you remember oh i had shoes i had clothes yet from home yeah i had clothes and the packages from the ghetto uh, you know what we got uh, shoes and uh, in case we have to get uh, uh, exchange for food or for a night to sleep over somewhere to stay at night or so when night fell I started I said let's go now I knew the ways around because I did travel before the war with my father and I knew that farmer if I go there if he's not there we'll never find him but if he's alive I'll find him there. So, it was the middle of the night probably. I knocked on the door. I came to the farm. I knocked on the door. And she came out. The lady came out. She said, Father's here. <laughs> that was unbelievable. My father was start to cry so hard. And I'd never seen him cry. Never. But in the <laughs> Cry. We were together again. How long? I don't know. But together again. Well, after the night, we ate something. We stood the day there. And we paid her. And some, I remember, but they gave her earrings or some. And we went further, closer to our town to our neighbors, to people that we know better, to be able to stay or to eat or whatever. I don't know what it was on our mind that we ran from from the dead and, and to learn how to live and what to do next. I don't know. We weren't prepared. I don't know who to blame. I don't want to blame my father. I don't want to blame, I guess... If my mother had lived, she was the leader. Maybe she would have thought of something more than uh, my father. My father was, I don't know, like all men under the Germans. They were put in place right away that you are the first to go. You are the bad ones. You, we're looking for you. Not the, not the, not the kids, not the, the, the women, not, not the, you, the man. So, they didn't have no more power. They didn't have uh, no no way, uh, no thoughts what to do next. They were they were without any ideas. Uh, only thing from day to day ideas is uh, just to go in and ask for a piece of bread or uh, to organize or something. No. There were some days I feel guilty, but I was a kid. I, I don't know. I didn't have any training or, or anything to to uh, to do something like that to organize it. And and now I, I see. Oh, I should have done that. Oh, I should have done. That. Everybody will say, "Why didn't you do that? Why didn't you do that? It wasn't easy to do that." I 
Ah. So then we start to go further to the next ones that we know. Further away from the town, further away something from a village, that a person that lives isolated, that no police would come there, nobody wouldn't be afraid to, to keep us there. So three of you travel together at this point? Yeah, we walk, yeah, together, yeah. Three, four. My father and three children. We came to that lady. My father knocked in the door. She came out. Ah, oh wow, wow, you are fine, everything is nice, and oh well, bring out some food for you, and you can stay here for a while, don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about it, but within uh, 10, 15 minutes, came out a guy with a gun, and he said, drop everything, what do you carry? You Who, drop was it? Who was this person? I don't know. I don't know. And she, I don't know, I even know her name either. My father knew her. I didn't. Drop everything. We dropped everything. And run, go. But he didn't harm us. So that was good. What did you leave there when you dropped it? When he, when he ordered you to drop everything, right? whatever we had, to, whatever my sister was carrying, whatever I was carrying, whatever we had, is shoes, uh, underwear, linens, uh, to change, to for food or for uh, any valuables. To, no, the valuables she had yet uh, a chain, I think, or something, but she had it. She didn't. Uh, my sister had it. And she had it. Uh, <coughs> so he gone further, gone further, closer to our town. He said. It's no good here and because they're strangers. Maybe they don't know us good enough. I don't know. We didn't have no more where to go there. <coughs> and we go closer to our town. There was uh, Gurne Fulbarek. It was a few farmers lived there, Polish farmers, and then some Ukrainian farmers did. No, after they chased out the Polish farmers, the Ukrainians moved in. Actually, it was Polish farmers because uh, when Poland took over, they tried to colonize, uh, make it Poland. So they brought in Polacks and they gave him land there. And they, uh, so the Germans chased them out. The Ukrainians chased them out under the Germans. So then the Ukrainians moved in there. <laughs> so my father walked into one, knocked on the door, and we were waiting outside. We didn't go in to them. Came out, I don't remember, they gave him a piece of bread, probably, I think they did give him a piece of bread or something. But about five, ten minutes, they were running after us. Dropped the coat and the boots. My father said, no. Dropped the coat and the boots. He said, no. How did you feel when you heard him say that? Fear. Fear of being killed. What's next? It's children. We, we, we weren't prepared. I'm telling you. To be even the soldiers in the army, I, they are they're fearful when it comes to the battle. And you take a young child and uh, you send him in this war to the battle because anybody can kill you here. It just takes a, a two by four and hit you over the head and you're dead. Or, or other ways. There are a million other ways to kill you. And believe me, they knew how. Because corpses you, you, you found after all over the places. <coughs> uh, so then he said, father said, no, not going to give it to him. So he hit him so hard with a stick. And on the end of the stick, it had, a, 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 I don't know, a, a root or something like that. And its hands, hands swell up like, like that. And they went away. They didn't give him. They didn't kill us. I don't know why. And the reason, maybe because they knew us. They felt bad. I don't know the reason. They let us go. The next thing we see, it is bad. It's gone bad to worse. I decided, I said, as daddy, should I go to the, to the camp where my brother is? We decided, well, you can save yourself. You're not any help to us. 
So I said, okay. I said, the next day I'll go. So we kissed and we hugged. And we said goodbye because this, we don't know if we are going to see each other again. Did your father give you any advice when you left? No, he couldn't. You cannot give advice to, to anybody. So I walked, it was about 15 miles along to the camp. Maybe less, 12. And when I came there, I couldn't go into the camp. I didn't know how to go. I cannot just knock at the door into the camp. Hey, Commandant, I'm here. I didn't know what to do. So there was one, uh, I seen a, a farmer going with a horse and wagon. Excuse me. And I asked him, where is he going? He said, to the quarry to uh, carry down the stones to the, the building the, the highway. And each farmer had, uh, had to do it. It was a duty every week. They had to go twice or something like that to bring down the stones. What was the name of this camp? Yachtorov. So I gave him, uh, my, the name of my brother. And my brother's job was there to write down the, the farmers who bring in down the, the quarry. So it was easy for him to find him because I told him, I said, the guy that writes down the, uh, how many times you you bring down the stones is my brother. How did you know? do you a favor too. How did you know what your brother was doing there? Oh, we knew before because when they took him to camp, my mother knew the, what do you call the, the guy, the, the guy that watches the camp, the forest, the forest rangers. Knew a ranger. And the ranger there with a quarry was so he was a uh, good with a meister the meister that takes uh, takes care on on the quarry and on on the workmen on the work it's nothing to do with the policeman this was the meisters they call the meisters and so through him he uh, asked the, ma the meister to give him an easier job so they gave him the job so he had a little bit easier. So he did give him the, the message. And not only that, my brother came for me. And because he knew the master too. So uh, he let him go. He said, but you got to be back in that, that time. I'm going to stop the tape now. Today is August 12th, 1996, and our survivor is Martin Sun. Uh, so my brother came down, and he said, you want to go into camp? It's fine with me. So, How did he look to you at this point? The same. As a matter of fact, he was only about a month earlier, they let him go visit us to the camp. He had a permission, and he came with his cousin and a policeman. And he paid uh, a farmer to take care. Uh, so he came to see us. It was wonderful to see him uh, in, the, in the ghetto. He seen the bad. So he went in and he said, All right, now you're one of us. You'll walk in, go back to, from work. You'll march with us. Well, march and march. I'll march with them. So, uh, you know. I'm with my brother, you know, with he is he is the one he's already a, a, a senior there. Yeah, I'm just a rookie. And they're singing. They have to sing. What's Martin song? is sing. Any song. They had a song. There there was a hey do na do na da na and then then they had words and then again the whole group hey do na do na da na you had to march in every day with a song. You couldn't worry. I don't know why. But this was their... Uh... So I came in there. The first thing was I had to go to, to the shoemaker. Took away my boots. And gave me the, 
the wooden shoes. What about your clothing? The clothing gave me a, a, a patch, a yellow patch in the front, a yellow patch in the back, a square. Did it have any writing on it? No writing, yellow. Yellow square. yellow square. Yeah, the yellow square in the front and back. And that was it. I was in. The first thing in the morning, yeah, he showed me, well, we have to sleep here on this time because on the other side is one corner where they have people sick with bladders and, and it's dripping a whole night. I mean, you wouldn't want to sleep there. So they had this one part reserved for the lot of sick people. How many people were in this camp? About 500. And who patrolled? Oh, there were walls around, believe me. You couldn't get out of there. And a barbed wire and then all four sides with the... Yeah, that was protected very, very good. Who actually supervised? It was, it was a commandant, a, a German. But who were the but actual the people Ukrainian patrolling around? Ukrainian police. Ukrainian police. And what was a typical day like there? Well, we started up early in the morning. I don't know, three, four o'clock. Was early. it light yet? No. Oh, it depends on the sun on the on. <laughs> uh, the first thing was to go for coffee. No, to wash. And, uh, because not everybody could get into the first... Uh, there were only about ten... Uh, forces? Uh, yeah, forces in one wash, washroom. Maybe there were more. I don't know where we were. I was standing about. What about the bathroom facilities? Uh, there were holes, sorry. Only holes. And made uh, go outside and made. So we went for the coffee and the slice of bread. Wow, what slice of bread? That was for the morning, for the day. We, we, we should have known that. So we got a slice of bread. Did anybody then, give you any advice or warnings when you were there? Did you know what to expect? No, yeah, yeah, the word was, my brother said, don't sleep near the window because sometimes that commandant likes to shoot them. They go out to shoot them. And so don't sleep near the window. So uh, this was the first advice. And, and the rest, not to sleep with the... Yeah, sick people, and uh, that was it. And the rest, you're ready. So we, to go to work, they took us with a, no, first was counting, counting, and counting. How long did that count. last? That, that lasts for probably an hour and a half. Standing and counting, and you go here to work, you know, this group and this group, and counting. And then finally, it's already finished the counting, the, the trucks came and they loaded 50 or no, wherever they were going to the quarry or to the highway or to the, to the machines where they, uh, where they were uh, crashing the, the stones. That was the worst because you, had, you couldn't rest anything because each one had a number. In a bar uh, barrel to uh, to go with. And there he was calling one, two, three. You couldn't say. Right? Once your number came up, you had to go. And then on top, if you didn't didn't have a full uh, barrel, you got your uh, portion. So it was hard. It's been, then when it was raining, it was slippery, and you go up and you empty it uh, into the to the machine, the crashing machine. And then there were uh, the trucks waiting, and just fill up the trucks with with the shovels. There was no machinery. The only machinery was the, the crushing machine, there. and the re the rest were well, everything done by hand. Were people injured doing this work? Mm, not injured. Well, if it was injured, he wouldn't say it. If it wasn't bad, because he wouldn't wouldn't want to go into the dorm to the little hospital, which it was there, uh, because over there, if you go in there, he was sick, and if the commandant came in, and so he locked it from the outside, put a lock on the outside, and waited a few days. And I said, "Go send in men, go clean up the place, and that's it." So he didn't shoot it. 
didn't take them out, just locked them in, not never took them out. So this was the the hospital, the, the camp hospital. So what was I? And uh, after work, what what happened? Oh, after work, they the uh, we got to march back to the to the camp. This we had to walk. How could far have been, was this? It could have been eight kilometers, ten kilometers. It depends where we were, but eight, ten kilometers. We had to walk in in groups of fifty or four at the, at the breast and walking. Before we came about a kilometer before the camp, we had to start singing. And uh, then who determined what you sang? Do you remember who determined this? Ah, uh, who determined it? The kids, that the boys that uh, made up these songs, they had talent because they had nice words to them. And they didn't care what it is, the, the, the Germans or the Ukrainians, as long as we said nice, we sang very nicely. It's, they had to be loud. And so we uh, came in there, back and going for soup. And standing in the line, and sometimes it was uh, to check if the your canteen was clean. God forbid if it wasn't clean, you got yours. What so, was the punishment? Punishment was hitting. I mean, with, with a with a stake or something like that. No, no shooting. No, not for that shooting. No. The on on the quorum there. It used to be uh, when the farmers used to come with a with a horse and wagon to carry these uh, stones down to take stones down to the machine or to the to the to the crusher. There used to be people that knew the farmers, and they used to go over to the farmers to beg for a slice of bread or something like that. And there the, the Meister was watching. If he seen you once going, maybe he wouldn't say anything. But if one farmer didn't want to give him something, or they not told us they would give him, he wanted to, to go to another farmer to ask him. And if he says, he seen him going again, he got angry. He said, where did you go? Hey, come over here. I wanted to go to make. He said, you want to go to make? Okay, sit down here, make right here. The poor guy could. So he said, okay, 25. So the 25 was very bad. It used to put you down on a barrel, one hole in the front holding your head between the legs, another guy lay down on, on your legs in the back, two guys in the side, two policemen, or the, one of the, the meister, meister himself, because he was uh, crippled, but he walked with a, with a cane and gave him 25. Can't, it had to be all 25. The body was blue, light like, and you see him 25, just for that. Uh, so th these were the punishments. This was every day. Go to work, you got the uh, uh, lunch came up and you got your lunch. The lunch wasn't too bad, it was soup with, you could find a, a piece of potato or and sometimes even a piece of meat from a horse because if a horse had to die, they used to bring it up there, they used to, uh, used to joke around that, uh, well, the horse didn't make it, so they brought it here. <laughs> and uh, Do you remember so any of these farmers being kind and purposely bringing extra food to give the, the inmates? Rather than uh, to give a, if they knew you, he would give a slice of bread. Yeah, they would give. I don't know if he didn't know you if he would give, or if you would have the guts to go and ask him. Because sometimes you knew the guy from home. He was a neighbor. He was a, so you ran to him. Hey, give me a piece of bread. Oh, so he couldn't probably say no neither. So he gave you if he wanted or not. Maybe some of them wanted to give you. I don't. 
I don't say that all of them were murderers. No. Did they realize that the bad conditions that you had been sure subjected they, to? Sure, they 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 seen it. They seen it. They seen what. That's the end of us. They seen everything. Listen, they were free. They were free to read. They were free to to watch. They was they seen. We couldn't because all we were hiding, or we were in camp. So we didn't have the opportunity to, to go read the papers, go listen to the radios. To, we didn't have the opportunity. First of all, they took away all the radios by punishments of uh, death. So everybody gave back the radio. What do I need a radio? Did these farmers ever bring you news? Did they ever tell you what was going yeah, on? Yeah, they, if they knew. So the, the good news they didn't have. So what is the news? Oh, they, they killed there, they killed here, they, they, they took away these people. Well, good news they didn't have, so uh, yes, they did. Did but you have uh, any awareness of what was going on with the war? Where the front was? Yes. The, the final, the um, Stalingrad, they did have a radio in my year. Uh, the two brothers had a radio. They took a chance, they, they got a radio. Where was this? I, they had a radio with them. In the camp? No, 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 in the ghetto. And when they had the big uh, crash in, on the Stalingrad, Hitler had a, a speech, and we, they were listening. I, I, I didn't understand German, but uh, my father understood German. And he said to them, if all, if, what do you say? After the war, if I'll find a Jew, I'll bend them, I'll, I'll bend my head to him. He said that in his speech, and my father heard it. But we did know the depression in under Stalingrad, but it was so far away. It was it was meaningless to us because we could get killed every day. Uh, the day was day to day. It's not that if we knew that oh another two months, three months, we didn't. Uh, it was so far away to us. Maybe it was our Far away, three months is nothing, but to us it was three years. And the chance of staying alive, or not only the chance, willing to survive, was getting low because it got so bad that people didn't care no more. There was one guy from our town, he came uh, voluntarily to, to the police, uh, please shoot me. They took him out and uh, they, they Gave him the, the privilege to shoot him. One girl uh, was uh, a boy, a farmer. Nice man, the farmer. I mean, uh, from a good family, a rich family. His boy got himself a Jewish girl. She ran away from ghetto. And he had fun with her. He was only about 12. The girl was already about 15. But he had fun with her. And he gave her food. He kept her for himself. The, the father the found out. He, he told the police, please take her away. Not that he didn't kill her, but he said, I don't want her. So the police came and they took her. She was almost gone crazy. She was, they took her. She was singing. So that, that was, Things that you heard, and uh, while while you are hiding, and he tells you, oh, you know whom the the farmers tell you, oh, you know whom they got today? They got this one. This one was killed. This one was killed. After we ran away, from, did I say that we ran away from the camp? No. No. So being camped like this for two three months. The Sundays was, I didn't mention it, the Sundays was bad. Because on the Sundays we had to perform for the commandant. Uh, he used to make the appeal, everybody standing in, in the, the rows and watching. And, and he used to sit down on a chair with a stick, always with a stick. Do you know who his, uh, what his name was? The first commandant was Kshimek. That was my, uh, but when I came to the camp, he was gone already. They replaced him with another one, so I don't know. It was a short time, and I don't know. 
first time is in my head because my brother was with him about a year. Shemek. Uh, the Sundays was bad. Uh, as we stood in the pier and we had to perform, and he gave two guys gloves, the hard working gloves, and fight it out. Whoever will win gets a extra piece of bread, slice of bread. Well, believe me, you could see blood running. It was unbelievable. Not only that, they were afraid. They had to fight. Not that he wanted to this piece of bread. He wouldn't rather not have the bread, but they had to fight for their own life. And finally, he said, okay, he stopped it. He said, bloody already, both bloody already. He stopped it, gave the winner a slice of bread. So people survive these matches? Yeah. Oh, they survived everything. And then, then he had to give a court. A heavy cord, put six people on one side, six people on the other side, and to pull. Who was going to pull hard? And, and he was taken I mean, and beating. You're not pulling enough stronger. You're not pulling hard enough or something like that. And, and it was his enjoyment, uh, his Sunday. He didn't have to, where to go to a show, or, so he got us and... And the appeal. Appeal was the first thing, the appeal. We had to stand two feet from row to row. One uh, policeman was walking behind one row, and the commandant was walking in the front. So if one was standing straight, the other standing straight, he had a big nose. Hit one with the nose. Why do you have such a big nose? Or one had uh, in the back, he was that he has a big uh, behind. Okay. He hit him with a, with a uh, gun in the, in, in the back. So he moved to the front. So the guy hit him in the front. And it was like, a, like a, a joke. You have a big belly. He hit him in the belly. So he moved back. So the guy, other guy in the back uh, hit him back. So that was their enjoyment. It, it, it was cruel and you had to stand and watch and not to say anything. The last Sunday was the worst because came and a guy, a, a Ukrainian guy, told the police or the commandant that one of the Jews wanted to buy a gun, asking for a gun, and he had to go from row to row and pick the guy, uh, the right guy. I don't know if he would recognize him or he knew him. Or I, we don't know. Finally. He was going for about an hour. I don't know if he couldn't find him or he just told him later, pick one. And so he picked one and he, they put him in front of us. Everybody had to stay, stand and watch him. I remember I was afraid even to look. And they picked ten guys, ten policemen. And they knelt, the policemen, they took aim. He was standing, watching them, just standing without the uh, cover on his side, nothing all like that. No. And ten policemen, they didn't shoot him with one bullet. Each one had a bullet. Uh, they make a big joke out of it. And they shot a guy. Then they took a few of the guys to bury him. The guy told him they had a hole like that. Because from each of uh, the guys, uh, each ten had a bullet. So, the next thing was that the rumors that they're going to liquidate the camp. They send in a new commandant. And that commandant, also rumors, I don't know, it's not that I heard the radar, not that I read the, the paper, that he liquidated already one camp somewhere else. What did you think this meant? This meant that. But how did that it will come? I, I, I don't think we had any other idea than to get killed. How it's going to come? Because we came already to the conclusion that we are going to get killed. How? When? That was the problem. That was the thought of... Uh, 
So once the rumor started that uh, it's going to be liquidated, and we came home to the camp, a few of the guys that worked in the camp were dead, were shot. So, uh oh, there is something new coming. Because why would he shoot the guys in the camp? I don't know, for whatever reasons, and there were, there were no reasons. So, we went to work the next day, but I think eight people ran away. And we didn't know what to do. And then we went back to see what's going to happen. We did go back that night, and the commandant heard eight people. He got furious. He was angry, real angry. And he said he came down, and the Jewish eldest, there was a Jewish eldest in the camp. And he said, I beg, but he wanted to shoot every tenth. The shoot. But I beg him, it's not going to happen ever again. And he promised, he promised that it's not going to happen. He should uh, forgive them this time. I don't know, whatever the truth, we know. <laughs> but they didn't do anything this time. But the second day, we went to work. The same thing happened. Not only eight, ten people ran away. He said, now we cannot go back no more. This is it. If we go back, we are dead. So we started to walk around and nobody wanted to, to go into the line to, to go back, to march back to the... It was a melee uh, that... Uh, These people disappeared from work outside the camp? Yeah. So you realized before you went back to camp? Yeah, we had to. No, we couldn't go back to camp no more. That was it. Once you're in camp, you're, you're... So we decided what, what to run. Policemen were standing on the other side from the forest. We couldn't run toward them. They were controlling that, that part. We knew my sister was there waiting for us. She, oh, I did tell the story there. My sister was there. In the forest? Yeah, she was near the quarry. She came to get us to go to my father. And instead of running toward her and go back to my father to the forest, we ran to the opposite direction because the policeman was standing there in that side. And we ran and ran. We had to run very fast because the policemen were coming from the police. Were, the reinforcement was coming from the camp and from the other police stations. And they, and they were shooting and, and unbelievable what was going on. And they caught back about 125, they caught back alive. Some of them they shot, a lot of them they shot dead. And How many escaped? Oh, it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell because we don't know how many escaped because they were killed later on. You understand? It's not that they survived already. Once you ran away, that doesn't mean you survived the war because you still had to struggle another another year to be liberated. So where did you go? Where did you travel now? We ran away in the direction of our town. But one village before our town, we knew one farmer and we said, let's go in there some food or something like that. We knocked at the door, and she opened the door. She said, wow. We told her who we are. He said, you are not the ones that ran away from camp. I said, no, no, we are not the ones. Because my son is is uh, among the, uh, the people that are catching uh, the... I said, no, we are not. Uh. So he said, you know what? Go upstairs, go up on the store, you stay there, I'll bring you food. Now this lady brought us food for three days that we really didn't want to leave. We thought if she wants to keep us <laughs> for the rest of the, would be very, very nice. But we weren't that lucky. The third day or the fourth day, the, her son <laughs> caught us there <laughs> and we jumped down and we ran away. He didn't do anything to us. 
But we ran, we couldn't go back no more. That was it. You cannot fool twice. You take your chance once. If you're lucky, you run away, fine. But don't press your luck too much. So we went to a, another village. In that village, we did something different. We came down to a farmer. We asked for some food. They knew us. They knew who we were because our business, they always came or they had the uh, uh, weddings or whatever. They came to buy beer, barrels of beer. So they all knew us, all the brown. So we, we ate there. Then we went out, went to the back door and we went over to, uh, to the barn. And we laid down to the, to the day. The next night we went out, we could go to another farm. And so on. We had quite a few already that we had uh, supper. And in the daytime we went to any of the uh, barns and we, and we stayed through the, stood through the day. It was very fine with us. But not until the, the farmers realized that they didn't want us there. So the, that they are hiding too. And that was against the, I don't know, whatever, against, <laughs> against, not their policy, but against the policy of the, of the Ukraine for a policy. It was the Ukrainian policy, not to help. Where did you go next? Next, we had to run back to the farm, to the father. The back to the father, we didn't know how to go there. We knew the village closest to that forest. So we had to go to that. It was far. It was, we had to go through the highway, which we were afraid. And then we had to go through a couple of villages. But it was before the winter. And it was about October, I think. And I'm gonna stop the tape now. Tape five today is August twelfth, nineteen ninety six, and our survivor's Martin Son. Okay, we decided that our luck is running out in that village and we had to get out of there. We made our way all the way to Chimnyzhenis. This is the nearest village near the forest where my father was in. When we came, we passed by one village already close. We, we went through a forest. We had to cut through the forest and we didn't know. We came out from the forest and we didn't know where we were. We had to go in to ask, otherwise we were lost. We knocked on the door, one door, that two guys came out. I said, wait, wait, and we're going to show you the way. Actually, what I asked him is not that I want to go to this village. What I asked him is that I want to go to another town far away, not to give out where I want to go. So, but when I came out from the house, I told my brother, let's run as fast as we can because these guys are after us. They, 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 they're not uh, too nice. So we started to run so fast, but we came to the other village, we didn't go to the village, we ran into the forest and we lie down and to wait and see what's happening. From the distance, we see two guys running on horses with, a, with lanterns, they thought of catching us, but they were unlucky, I think at that time we beat them, we were faster than their horses. So. Uh, the thing that you have to be fast, you have to decide where it's, where you have to run, where you, you have, you can take your time. And this time we had to run very fast. But then how to, okay, we decided that our luck is running out in that village and we had to get out of there. We made our way all the way to Chimnyzhenis. This is the nearest village near the forest where my father was in. When we came, we passed by one village already close. We, we went through a forest. We had to cut through the forest and 
we didn't know, we came out from the forest and we didn't know where we were. We had to go in to ask, otherwise we were lost. We knocked on the door, one door, the two guys came out. I said, wait, wait, we're going to show you the way. Actually, what I asked him is not that I want to go to this village. What I asked him is that I want to go to another town far away, not to give out where I want to go. So, but when I came out from the house, I told my brother, let's run as fast as we can because these guys are after us. They, 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 they're not uh, too nice. So we started to run so fast, but we came to the outer village. We didn't go to the village. We ran into the forest and we lie down and to wait and see what's happening. From the distance, we see two guys running on horses with, a, with lanterns. They thought of catching us, but they were unlucky. I think at that time we beat them. We were faster than their horses. So, uh, the thing that you have to be fast, you have to decide where it's, where you have to run, where you, you have, you can take your time. And this time we had to run very fast. But then how to get to my father? This is the forest. I, we knocked at one door and he said, well, we see a, a girl coming down for water every evening. But one girl only, a father and one girl. I said, no, it has to be two girls, two sisters. He said, if you want to know more about them, the next door, go ask them, they will know exactly where they are. When I knocked at the same door, they were very surprised to see us. They said, wow, made it. And they took us right away to the father, and they told us the story how uh, how my uh, little sister died. It was Yom Kippur. They were fasting, even though they didn't have what to eat, but they were fasting. After Yom Kippur, they, she got a piece of bread from somewhere in the village, and she probably got appendicitis. Because two days it took her. Painful, very painful. The screaming was heard probably to the seventh heaven, I don't know if nobody heard that. And the third day she was she died in my father's hand he was carrying her. But they buried her there and uh, now the way my father came there after I left for the for the camp, he met another couple and his wife was from that village, from Chimishin, so she knew uh, about his forest. She told him, and she said, okay, let's go as a group. Let's go together there. And they made it there. And then met that couple, that farmer, that showed us. They were just very lucky. They were very nice people, very, really did. Poor people, but they helped in every way they, they could. They took, a, took them into the forest. They showed them how to live. They built a bunker for them for the winter, they were to sleep. And when we came, we lived there for, I don't know, with them already for a few weeks. But before the winter, we said, we don't have clothes, we don't have food. Let's go to our town. We have neighbors and we will get some food. Somehow we will get some potatoes or whatever we can, and we will carry it back here. We're not going to go stealing. That was the problem. We weren't thought of stealing. Maybe we should have. And we decided to go back. We would go back. My father was sick already in that time. He hardly made it to our town. It was far. It was already winter was coming. It was probably December, late December. Frozen everything. Cause, uh, and uh, we made it. We went into one of the farms, one of our neighbors good neighbors. And while my father went in with my sister and I and my brother were waiting outside. While they, uh, they were waiting, we thought or oh, somebody was passing by and we thought that they seen us. And we got very scared and we started to run away. 
start to run away. When my father came out from, from there and my sister came out, we weren't there no more. So they went out of town to a farmer and we went out of town to a farmer. But we didn't meet. We almost met one night a difference and we couldn't meet. We went back to the same village and we couldn't stay there no more because they were, we felt like it's not the same, it's hostile. And my sister was separated from my father too, somehow. And she went to the same village. But we thought that we're not going to stay there. Where did you go? We, we, we decided to go back. Where? To the other farmer where we can find meet yet father. This was our only chance to meet our father there. And my father, I was right. He was waiting for us there. So that day, when we decided to go, in the morning, my brother wakes up and he says, I had a bad dream. What was the dream? I had a dream. I seen my mother and she said, she saved you, but she couldn't save me. I said, okay, it's only a dream. And I said, let's proceed. And at night we'll go back. We're not going to stay here. At night we seen, we go, no, no, it was no more at night. In lunchtime, at lunchtime, the farmer came in to the, to us. He said, get out because the police are in, in the village. I said, let us stay back and let us stay till the evening because in the daytime we cannot walk around. He didn't say anything. So we thought that he agreed or something like that. I don't know if he came, went for the police or somebody else. I really don't know. But about a half hour later, the police came. What happened? And I thought that maybe they just came uh, for something else to him, you know, for tax or for something else. But they opened the bar and said, come down, Jews. I said, uh oh, we are in trouble now. And we were laying there almost naked because of the cleanliness. We couldn't wear the clothes. Shoes are off. I looked around. It was snow outside. It was snow that deep already. It was beginning of January, I think. I think January the 4th or something like that. And I said, oh, oh I've got to jump down to the barn. There are openings. You push away these uh, branches and you can jump down. He went to look who is, uh, who is there, who is talking to him. Probably they, they got a rifle on him. So I don't know, he got scared or something like that. And he, and he stood there. Or he wanted to give me a chance to run away. I really don't know. Could be either one. I jumped out through the back. And I had to run about, I would say, more than half a mile to the forest. And it was snow, but knee deep. When, when they seen it, I'm not coming down, they ran around the barn and they started to shoot after me. But I was a little distance array, away already. I was running as fast as I could, believe me. It's, uh, by the time I came into the forest, I felt uh, safe. I just looked at me if I'm, if I'm all right, if I'm not uh, injured. Now, what do I do now? I have no shoes. I have no clothes. It's, the snow is that deep. I went into the forest. The forest is no snow because the, the trees cover, but it's cold. Cold, I, I have no, the only thing what I had was I went into the forest. I don't know about. 200 yards, 300 yards, I don't know. Because I had to come out. I couldn't stay there no more. I had to come out at night to get some, something to cover my, uh, my feet. The only thing I had was in that time a hat. I remember I took the hat, I put my two feet in the hat, and said, that's how I stood, or sat down on them. I was waiting till it got good dark, I don't know. Didn't have a watch. You know, seven, eight o'clock. 
the winter time it's already late because it gets dark about five or something like that. And I went back to the village to the first farmer. I didn't know anyone. So I walked into a store and well, first I warmed up a little bit because it's warm and, and the store. And then the farmer came at night to give them water, to water their cows or whatever. And he seen us. Who were you with? Well, myself. And I mean, he seen me. So I begged him just for some rags for the feet to cover my feet and uh, now go. He brought two old little, I mean, shoes torn, but he gave me rags to cover them, to, uh, to cover them up and tie them up. I did that and I said I didn't have any clothes, but nothing I can do. I have to walk. So I walked back to the place to the first farmer that I told I have to uh, meet my father. This is the only place where he would be if I went. I went back and he's, it was uh, too late, one, too, one day too late. They killed him last night. Four people. He got four people there and he got them together. He said, we will go to that forest and we'll bring some food with us and he was waiting for us. If not us, he would have been alive. But we were one day too late. So they got him. Where was your sister? His sister was separated. She was in she's in that village that we were going from day the days sleeping in the, in the in the barn and at night going to ask for she did the same thing, but for herself now. We were all separate, all three of us. So there, once I wanted to stay there for the day, the farmer said, no, you cannot stay there, but you can go to that house where they killed your father. There was an empty house, Polish people lived there, they chased them out. You can stay there, because nobody going to bother you. They killed already the, the Jews there. So I went there within a half hour, a young guy came. I don't know how he got it, how he knew. And he said, oh, you are both son, and I, his son. Yeah, he said, no, here, they, they killed all four. The one was a young guy, friend of mine, he was in the same class with me. See, he, this guy, he tried to run through the window. See the blood on the window? That was when they got him. So I said, well, they're dead. I'm alive still. What am I going to tell? So he said, okay, you can stay here. Don't worry about it. Nobody's going to touch you here. I stood till, I don't know, three, four o'clock in the morning when it started to get the uh, light, I said, I got to get out of there because I started to walk toward the little forest. It was not far, but a hundred yards, hundred fifty yards. I see one guy on a sled with a horse galloping very fast, stop and screaming to me, stop. That probably was the same guy. But I was already close to the fires. I'm not going to stop because he 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 screamed stop. So I got into the fires. I stood there for a, through the day, and at night I went back to that farmer. <coughs> they were nice people, but the help just give you food and go and see. Oh, how pitiful it is. So I went back, he gave me food, he gave me yet a piece of bread, and I said, okay. Did you get clothing in this time? No. I, I think, yeah, he did give me a, a jacket, something, that old jacket he gave me. The shoes I had already tied up. What about your legs? Good. What? What protection did you have for your legs? I had these old shoes and, and your legs. Your legs, your pants? Yeah, I had pants. Pants, 
And the lady said, the lady said, well, it's beautiful, but how far can you go? It was snowing. It was so cold. And so I said, all right, I'll live. And I said, goodbye, thank you for everything. And I go, I said, I cannot go with the streets because it's dangerous. Once I get caught there, so I said, I make my way. This is our town. This is the village. And I got to go right be between, right? So I made my way pretty good to the cemetery. I went in on the cemetery there, took a rest, sat down, ate a piece of bread. And I said, now I have to go <coughs> to Yachtorov, to the same place. And from there, I have to go with a forest. But it was blowing so hard that when you walked, you couldn't see anything in front of you. And I said, okay, now I have to start walking, going because it's late. And I started to walk, 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 and my, just in my direction, I, I felt. Walk, walk, I don't know, I walked about an hour or two hours, I really don't know what. I came back to my the same spot. I said, oh my God. Now I'm really, it's getting late. I got to make it fast now. And I have to take my chances, go through the villages, because I, I cannot make it through uh, this way. So I was, I was going through villages, but I didn't go into the village. Instead of going through the village, I made my way around the village. And I came back to the road and, and made it to the forest. How long did you stay in the forest? In the forest, I stayed about another five months. How did you get food? I was with other people and they had some money, I guess, and they were buying and I stood with them. I was doing the, the shores. I was cooking and uh, going for water and, uh, but they had money and they, they supplied. I mean, it wasn't much to, it was a time that we had enough from the uh, mushrooms. You know, they grow, you could pick mushrooms in there, and so I, we had mushrooms for a month or so, and then uh, they, they, through them, they had, I guess they had money, or they had some people they knew, because I didn't know anybody there, I was a stranger there. In my town, I knew I went to go in and ask not to be killed. Over there, I did not. Who so were these they, people? Do you know who they, they were, these four yeah. people? There was Mir, she went to Canada, a lady with a son. Uh, it was uh, two sisters from Shemishlane. I One uh, got caught. I didn't tell even the, the story about how she got caught. We were in the forest together. Did I? No. Did I miss it? I did. Uh, Oh yeah, I'll still tell the story. Two ladies, three ladies, and each one had a, a child, about seven, eight years old. And one of the Pollocks, of the partisan Pollocks, liked one lady. So he used to bring in help. I guess they had some money too, maybe he exchanged them for them, I, I, I really don't know. But I know that he liked it. Then came another Paula, and he liked her too. But him, we were afraid because he was no good. He was, he was a murderer yet before the war. But we couldn't get rid of him. He knew our password. When he comes, he'll give us a password and everything. And he will bring us salt. He tried to, he was trying to be good. He did bring salt, but we didn't want from him anyway because we were afraid of him. And we were so right because eventually he did bring the, the Germans. He had a password. It was one time that he went to Poland and we said, thank God that he left us. I'm jumping. I, <laughs> then he left, but he came back and he had us, uh, the password, he came back and he's, 
and he was here. He said, "Wow, well, what are we going to do now?" He said, "Nothing. I'm going to come back tonight. I'm going to bring salt and uh, matches, uh, you know, certain things that we need and potatoes or whatever." But instead, he brought the, the police, and they caught one lady. Actually, they wounded her, uh, and the kid stood near her. They took her down. I don't know what happened to her. Where they take her, I don't know. And uh, and another girl they they caught. they caught. And the rest, we ran away. Everybody in different direction. They couldn't get us. At night, he was walking around with our password and, and get us. But uh, we didn't give him that pleasure. He, he couldn't get us. Even though he knew the forest thoroughly, but he couldn't get us no more. And that was the end. That was before the liberation. What happened? When were you liberated? Well, uh, we heard the shooting, the, the katushas and the coming through. I mean, uh, you know, when a front goes through, you hear. But the only thing we didn't know is who won, who is in. You know, we we knew that the front passed us by, and uh, who liberated you? The Russians. When was this? Uh, that was about May 1944. What was your condition by this point? I would say I was very thin, but I was healthy. I wasn't sick. And Were you able uh, to find any surviving family members after this? Uh, the only one that uh, survived is my sister. She came back to the forest after three months staying by all by herself in that village. Finally, they started to shoot him because there was another one in the village that they hung from. Another one was shot. So she's, she's seen that the luck is running out. So she came about 40 miles all by herself walking through the forest. And she made it. How did the Russians treat you on liberation? Ah, uh, not bad, not uh, good. I mean, they didn't care. Who are you, Jew? Who cares? Uh, if we found uh, the first one, I found was a Russian uh, uh, doctor, a Jewish doctor, naturally. So, so he gave us uh, an American can of uh, meat. I remember. So we ate that and gave us a pair of pens. Where did you go after this? We went to Przemyślana. It was a town. And uh, we went in there. There were Jews already that came out from out of forest. And one was a very nice person. She let us uh, sleep over there, me and my sister. Did you ever return to your home? Yeah, we did return. Stayed there about a week in Przemyślana. We said, well, now let's go and see what was happening in our town. When we went back, we didn't, what to eat we didn't have. On, on the way, uh, halfway we had a truck that we jumped on and we were hiking on, on a truck. Finished. And uh, in another few kilometers we had to walk. But I, I was eating apples, green apples, and I got very sick. By the time I got to my town, I lay down already on a farmer's uh, house, and, and I was I had such cramps that I thought I'm going to die there. I know she brought out some tea, and, and the final the cramps passed by, and, and I went into the town. I asked any Jews around here. They showed me in the house where the police were. Unrad was uh, occupying. There were Jews. I went in there. That's what I found. About seventeen Jews. Out of how many? About two thousand. Yeah. Where did you go next? Uh, next was I went uh, to get something to wear. I went to neighbors, Ukrainians. I got something there. Yeah, what she was, was the reaction clear. seeing your return? I don't know. They were surprised. How did you make it? How did you do it? Where were you? You know, things like that. I should go and tell him my story, which I wasn't too uh, ready to tell him that. And it's, uh, but at the same time, I tried to be like anybody else. I didn't want to tell him 
I'm a survivor. I didn't want to tell him stories. I didn't want to tell him I'm a Jew. Uh, there was no reason for me. Nobody asked me for it. How long did now, you stay in the town? In the town, we stood two years. How did you support yourself in that I time? was worried. What did you I do? I took a job uh, selling beer. <laughs> and it was very good. I had plenty of money. I had what to wear. I bought clothes. I bought the food. I, I tried to to make up for the time that I lost. I had uh, like six eggs in the morning for breakfast. I had uh, butter, a pound of butter. I, I melted and I drank it. Other people would get sick. I didn't. Where did uh, you go after this? It's after that we went to Poland because this became Russia. Since we were Polish citizens, we could apply to emigrate to Poland. Where did and you go? We went to Bitum. And what Poland. was there? Uh, just registered to get out of the, of Poland, get out of the bloodthirsty lands there and, and to get out of there. And and where did you go after this? Uh, we went from there. They took us by train through Czechoslovakia. They told us that uh, you're just you are Greeks and, uh, you know, we had to go to Czechoslovakia to uh, Austria. And Linz. Then Linz was the uh, a camp, a you UN, UN camp. And what did you do there? Uh, there I didn't do anything. We didn't stay there long. We just tried to get closer to Israel. <laughs> we went to, to Italy. And uh, then Israel, uh, Palestine that time was closed for the Jews. And, and some clandestine uh, people were going, but they took him to Cyprus and... Uh, then I had letters from, I had an aunt in Miami, and she begged us, come here, you don't have anybody there. And so I decided, well, let's go to America and get rich fast and, and live like anybody else. Which, first of all, my thoughts of America was a little different. I thought that everybody's rich. <laughs> when did you get married? I got married in 1957, about seven years after I came here. Yeah. How long did you stay in Miami? Uh, about five months. What did you do there? Waiter. And then what? And then I said, it's not my <laughs> my profession. I was a machinist. I learned from it. I thought I can make my money in, in New York. Whoever doesn't make it in New York won't make it anywhere. <laughs> so we went. And first of all, I had friends here. And, and I said, I'll go to New York. And it was closer. My sister was in Canada. I wanted to be closer to my sister, so, so I came. Stop the tape, yeah. Not a tape? Six, today is August 12th, 1996. Our survivor is Martin's son. Well, <laughs> As I started, when we came here to, to the United States, this was uh, 19, December 1949, I went to Florida, which, uh, where I had a cousin, and I worked there for a few months. For, when did you get married? I got married 1957. I came back from Florida, I got a job, got a good job, a machinist and uh, and I met my my future wife at a dance I tried to be like everybody else I mean go to dance and still live the life like a, even though at night sometimes I lay down and and we had our nightmares and uh, different thoughts of uh, the normal people that go home and and have a normal uh, night's sleep, but we did not. Even if I went to a dance, even if I went there, I still had to go home. And, and or I read the papers, and anything in the papers touched me right away. And it's uh, so this was the difference. But I tried very hard. The first ten years, I would say, was a little easier because I blocked out completely. I am. I thought I was the same as anybody else. I thought of being the same as anybody else, which probably 
none of us are. We sooner or later, the 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 past comes to haunt us, uh, to haunt us, to to memory comes back and, and it hurts us. It's uh, sometimes. Uh, Special on occasions that we have a wedding and uh, you're the only one. And Could you tell us your wife's name? Uh, my wife's name is Jane Lipton. And she is not a survivor from the Holocaust. She is uh, uh, Argentinian born. And she's normal. I'm that normal. <laughs> normal people. So thank God we had one normal in the family so we could raise normal kids. What are your children's names? Uh, the first one is Renee, second is Sherry, and the third is Wayne. They all had good schooling. Uh, two, uh, one went to Bernard, one went to Columbia, and one went to NYU. So they're normal. How would you describe your religious affiliations now? Uh, I don't think I could go back to uh, to uh, orthodoxy. I'm more... Uh, I feel to belong to the Jewish people, so I belong to conservatives. We have to belong, otherwise we're losing completely our Jewish heritage and everything else. And what about your so children's observance? They are back to orthodoxy. Because I did send them to yeshiva, and they all finished yeshiva of language. And then they went to good schools, and they're all fine. Thank God. But did you ever question the existence of God? Yes, many times. Was, how could it happen? How could it uh, go on for such a long time? How could it... Uh, it's not to the non-religious people, it happened to the religious people. I mean, there was Sadaikim and there was Sadaikis and, and everything. Why would it happen to them? Uh, there was no answer on, uh, on that. I mean, if you believe, you got to believe it, and that's it. It's no questions. It's uh, that's why I felt. And as a Jew, I had to, like you say, belong to some things. So the next best thing to be a conservative. Is and then to give it over to the ch to the children and you, if you want, you can continue whatever you want. You have the background, you have the education, so you can do whatever you want. It's I give it to you. Did you ever feel that you witnessed any miracles in this experience? Uh, the only miracle that I witness is when my mother, uh, when my brother had the. I don't know you call it a, a miracle or not, but it's something that I don't know if it has anything to do with uh, something with religion or not. Or that mother saved him, he couldn't I uh, saved me and couldn't save him. I don't know what to make out of that. It's uh, miracles. Well, each one is a miracle. When I ran away, it's a miracle. When when they didn't catch me, it's a miracle. When uh, and I survived three years as a miracle when I survived the, the, the typhus and typhoid as a miracle. I, if you want to call miracles, a uh, million of miracles. When I walked out and, uh, and the, these two guys didn't catch me, it was a miracle. Uh, when I ran faster than the horses, it's a miracle. It's a lot of miracles. I mean, it's, uh, when you ask for miracles, uh, there are a million of them. There's three years of miracles, one after the other. It's, uh, it's very hard to uh, to uh, tell you all of them. Early on in the testimony you just gave, you mentioned the cognac. How did that come into play? Oh, the cognac came in very, very handy. And then the ghetto, the only thing what it brought also was sores, was also bad uh, for my father. Because when we finished the last bottle, to to sell the last bottle, and the German came for more, we didn't have. And not only they came for more, he came with a dog, with a sh uh, black German shepherd, and he asked for more, and father said, I don't have. He said, so he, uh, 
helped with the, with his dog. He he hit my father with with a with a stick, and that was a sign for the dog to to uh, to jump him and pull pieces of flesh from from. It was unbelievable. We were the three children was just watching how he's torturing my father with a dog, and finally he seen that. We don't have, he wouldn't have gone through, we didn't have. So he just let him go and that was, that episode finished with a cognac. What do you think gave you the strength to survive? I don't know, to tell the story something that they're going to make a hero out of me. And it was very disappointing when I came out of the forest, I wasn't a hero, nobody cared. There was nobody to cheer me. And so we had to go on, just start up from zero, and just go on the best we could. And I would didn't do so bad. But uh, that was the reason for 10 years or 15, 10, 15 years. It was good because I wasn't a, a survivor. I wasn't a refugee. I was, I tried to be like anybody else. I don't know if it came out that way, but that's why I tried to. You mentioned dreams and nightmares. What were they like? It was bad. It was catching me or, or, or running after me or, or things like that. My wife used to wake me up. It's uh, screaming and it was bad. What advice do you have for your children, grandchildren, and future generations? I tell them to, to be good and, and belong to, to the people, belong to your people. It's, uh, we got to get together, we got to be together and, it's the only way to for you to survive. It's it's to continue the Jewish practice. They they teach us good things, not bad. It's so you cannot go wrong if you follow the Ten Commandments. You cannot go wrong. Plus, a Columbia University uh, degree doesn't uh, hurt neither. So they go both together very nicely. What message would you now like to deliver to the world? Read more about the Holocaust. See the things that the church did to us. Uh, so you'll understand us more because some of the preachers were very bad. Like we had one in our town and on a ceremony on a Sunday, he told his parishioners that we dipped our fingers in Jewish blood. Let's wash our hands in the Jewish blood. I mean, it, this was preaching, a, a preacher, a Ukrainian preacher, he went to Canada, he had to run away for a month. So, if they read, if they study, if they, what the church did to the Jewish people, and they will understand and learn that it doesn't do no good because they are suffering too. A lot of them suffer now for different reasons. Not because some of them are because of the Muslims, some of them because they are in Bosnia or other places or... Uh, so it's the same thing. Same thing. Like when I see things like uh, in Bosnia, like one in relation is killing the other one, it reminds me the, right away comes back the persecution I had. Not that I want them, they should go through this persecution, but it feels me a little bit closer. But oh my God, this is the same thing. Not to me. Do I feel better about it? In a way, yes. Because it shows them how we felt. But in the same thing, these kids are innocent the way we were innocent. And they sub. So the only thing is the world to know, let them learn. But I don't want they should learn from Bosnia or other way. Let them learn from the books. Let them learn from history. Thank you on behalf of the Shoah Foundation. These are survivors from my town and from the surrounding villages. 
On top is Mike uh, Mechel firing. Dukla. Which side? The top left. Michael firing. Then Dukla. Then I am on the, my right. On the right. On the bottom is uh, Mandelschlumper. Left uh, Ruben. Leinwand. Leinwand uh, Hamidis. Mendel, uh, Mendelschlumper. Nas. And Leiche. Holland, and she's uh, from the province. I don't know her name. Uh, when was this taken? Lights of Roman. This was taken uh, on a 1945. Uh, I don't know. We got together on a holiday. I don't remember the holiday, what it was. This is a 19... Uh, 46 in Britain and Poland we were organized already as a group to go to Israel Zionist group I am here the first one from my left hold it hold it hold it here first one on my left that's me sitting or standing standing and next to me are a group of I don't remember all the names so I'm not going to mention it by the name this is my sister Which one? on the right, holding the the picture. The right, and these are people I don't remember the names. They went to Israel. This is taken in the Vatican. Uh, I'm standing there, and one of my uh, landsmen from. My Tan, or his name, and his wife and a child. When was this taken? It was taken nineteen forty seven. It's I am standing. Uh, this is the wedding of uh, Martin Sam and Jane Lipton in nineteen fifty seven. Where was the wedding? It was uh, in Brooklyn, on Avenue Z, Jewish, temp Jewish uh, temple. Uh, this is my 25th anniversary. At the top row, my brother-in-law. Which side? From left to right. My brother-in-law, Henry. Last David, name? his son, David. Uh, my last, wife. Last names. My wife, Jane, son, and my uh, nephew's wife, Debbie. And next to her, I am. Next to her is my niece. The name? Uh, Rhoda, Dr. Rhoda Sperling. And my sister. And I see my brother in law there in the back. Name? Lola Sperling. And my brother-in-law, Arthur Silverstone. Ah, this is my son, from right to left. His Wayne, name? my daughter, Renee. What last name? Hauser, and my daughter, Sherry Sosnick. And my daughter-in-law, uh, Ariella Song. Uh, this is the wedding of my oldest daughter, Renee, to Jerry Hachauser. When was this? That was 10 years ago, 1986. This is five children of my daughter Renee, start from top. The girl, the oldest one I'll start, is Laura. 
to her left, from left, is Adam. To the right is Richard. In the middle is Seth. And the last one is Kevin. Uh, this is my son, Wayne, and Ariella, son. Married in 1987. Uh, uh, this is my son's four children. Starts up from the left is Yitzhak, Eliana, Asi, and Elisa. Ah, this is uh, a picture of the breast of my daughter, Sherry. The picture on the left is my wife. My daughter Sherry holding the baby. What's the baby's name? Michael. Uh, and this is my son in law, Charlie. And that's me on my right next to Charlie. And this is Kevin, was there too. And this is Judah. And this is Sabrina in the middle, little girl. And to the left is Stephen. Well, here, this is my wife. This is the girl I changed the name from Lipton to Son. And she is, she doesn't regret it. No, I love you. Right. Okay. And we are married 38. When I say 38, she said 39. <laughs> Okay, so 39, it's good. Well, we had our ups and downs, but it's nice. It's come very nicely. We are happy. We are proud of our families. What do we, of our children, of our grandchildren. They're beautiful, all beautiful, and let's hope it will go on like that. Be happy and, and have simchas. Thank you. Welcome.